Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education is... Amazing! Thousands of copies have been sold across the United States and the world. You can pick up your copy today on Amazon. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to add up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio, back with you on another episode here as I... Um, I'm a little out of sorts. My office has been moved here on the campus of Lindenwood University, and I was out of town when it was moved. So I came in this morning. Some stuff is in boxes. My podcast equipment is spread all across. I couldn't find the connector to make my sound effects work, which would be absolutely horrible if we didn't have them, right? Or maybe it would be a good thing. I'm not sure. Uh, but either way, I am pulling it together uh, because I'm on the spot. And I'm on the spot because we have a presidential co-host yet again, one of the first 125 presidents we interviewed on this podcast, and his name was in our book, uh, along with 124 others. Uh, it's an absolute honor to bring him back here to the Oedip Experience. Ladies and gentlemen, he is Dr. Daniel Kaur. He is the president of Arizona Western College. Daniel, what's going on? How are you? Hey, what do you say, Dr. Joe? Great to be with you. And boy, we I mean, uh, what, what an amazing episode we have coming up, but I'm, I'm looking, I'm honored to join you and uh, looking to have some fun today. Well, when I saw your name, we put out the call and said, who would be crazy enough to come uh -huh. uh, podcast with me? And I saw the name Dr. Daniel Core, and then I felt real pressure. Holy crap! But I'm going to get it right, I promise. Um, although we have a pretty amazing guest you yeah we do what you say she's she can she she can do all magic things we don't even know what kind of magic she has yet uh, <laughs> but we know that she is magic and i'm going to bring her in because uh it's nine o'clock p.m where she is and only noon where i am on central standard time so we got to get her to give us the good stuff and then get her off to get some sleep ladies and gentlemen here she is <laughs> sally ann delacasa she's the chief identity hacker at gleek sally ann what's going on how are you? How are you? And thank you for having me. You sound very awake for nighttime, but I guess that's probably because you work into the evening because you have to keep up with the U.S. time. That's right. And hold on. I have teams in India, so I work the morning time, then my Dubai time, and then my night time. So you know what? I am life of a startup founder. You work around the clock. Ah! Well, hopefully you can get some sleep along the way. I want you to level set for us first for our audience that haven't, hasn't heard of Gleek. You're the chief identity hacker, which is the greatest title in the no history of title making. Let's just be yeah. honest, because it's ominous. It's like professional, it's cool, it's threatening if you really want it to be, right? I mean, it's all everything all at once. So tell us about Gleek first and then tell us what you do. Absolutely. Um, so Gleek is a comprehensive skilling platform that allows you to access 500 plus of the world's leading experts um, to be able to learn with them and get their insights and have access to them live. Um, and we deliver them using very cool technology like Mentor GPT and also NFT technology. So, you know, we're shaking up the education sector with how we deliver um, upskilling and learning. Um, and the title, I have to tell you about the title because everybody comments about the title. Um, so uh, the title, when we hear the word hacker, we think of like, just something bad, right? Like what the I, heck is going on? <laughs> but when you think about what a hacker does, it goes, a hacker is somebody who goes beneath the surface. And when you think about what Gleek does, we go beneath the surface of the traditional ornaments of, um, uh, uh, sorry, Daniel, university degrees, um, ornaments of success. And we go below yeah. and we look at human ingenuity and wisdom and human skills and how you actually signal and showcase that. So that's why, um, you know, we call, I call myself the identity hacker. It's because I go below the hood. Amazing. I love that. Cause you have to look, you, you're looking below the credential for what the learning, right? That's yeah. essentially what you're digging for, what you need to learn, how you need to learn it. What's, what's the expectation for the future? and understanding technology and how that has entered our life. So I'm assuming you said mentor GPT. I thought that is, that's what you said, or mentor yeah. AI. I can't remember exactly what you said, but I saw it on your website too. I mean, you're using AI to deliver learning, right? 
Yeah, and human skills learning. So that's, you know, that's kind of the irony of what it is we're doing. So we just launched this month, Mentor GPT, and um, uh, it's important, particularly where we are right now in the world, right? Where AI, we're looking at AI and we're looking at, well, what is our relevance as humans? And our relevance as humans really comes down to, you know, those of us who are contrarian thinkers, obscure thinkers, outlier thinkers, and all of those things tie to human skills. And um, our mentor GPT allows learners to be able to try on or practice whatever they're learning and see how chat GPT will answer it. And then what we do is show you how human experts answer it, who are contrarian, outlier, um, and obscure thinkers. So what it really does is shows you the difference. You know, everybody keeps saying, are we going to be relevant or not? We're showing you who's relevant and why they're relevant and what's different about them. So um, very, so excited about that. Really, really excited about that. Tell them like it is. I love that, Sally. I'm going to go over to you, Daniel. You're, you're on. Yeah, Sally, let me jump in here. I was... Uh... Uh, doing a little noodling on, on, on your website, like Dr. Joe was, and I, I saw the timeline of your organization, and, and it said in 2018, really no traction with uh, universities or colleges, your traditional bastions of learning, and then COVID, uh, and then increased technology. So tell, tell me about that no traction part of it, what the response actually was, and then what changed in that 2019 into 20 uh, time period? Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you look at my history, I'm I'm a teacher at heart, right? Uh, or I should say I'm a teacher in by DNA. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> so if you go back, you know, at 21, I designed it. I was part of, I was in the U.S. school system. So I designed the Kapow, the Kids in the Power of Work program under the Child Labor Committee that's still in the state of New York and Florida. So educators and education is like, you know, that's kind of like my North Star. So when I built the product, clearly the first thing was, okay, I'm going to finally shake up the whole education system. Um, yeah. and now I'm going to have, you know, students will be able to showcase their human skills and then ingenuity and, you know, um, employers can be able to see them. And what I found, um, Daniel, and, you know, I'll, and I'll tell you what the shift is, but what I found was, I think pre-COVID, um, most of us, and I say this with great respect, because remember, I'm a teacher at heart, but, you know, educators are really the, not the, not the outliers, they're the laggards, right. they're not the ones who lead innovation, and that breaks my heart, because Yikes. they are, educators are the custodians of the future, right, because mm. that's how you, you touch the future, teachers touch the future every single yeah. day. Um, so, you know, I really was up against a, and, and particularly the stakeholders in the education system. So the stakeholders, it's like, okay, how do we get past the teachers? How do we get past the parents? How do we get past, right? It's it's not even getting to the kids. It's like the stakeholders around. Yeah. How do you, so um, we really hit a wall um, through the high school system. You know, we looked at the last two years of high school when we were kind of looking at you know, where do I want my child to study? And then the university system of going, wait a minute, the first year in, why don't we figure out a layer of the self-awareness of like, who am I and why am I here in this world mm -hmm. versus, you know, figuring out all the stuff and then two or three years in graduating going, okay, what do I do now? Like, I, I still don't know who I am, right? So, and then COVID happened, um, which was really interesting, right? So what was really interesting about COVID was, um, you know, and I share the story, I remember it was August uh, 2020, and ASU GSV, which is one of the biggest events that happened in the Oh, world. yeah, love it, out in San Diego, love it, yeah. absolutely. So ASU GSV happened virtual, and we got a call out of the blue, I mean, I'm not kidding you, this is us, you know, going after education, we got a call out of the blue from the folks at Strata Education and Juvo uh, Ventures, Western Governors University, and they were like, you're not here, but everybody's talking about Gleek on stage. Uh and what are you doing? And why don't you, why don't we do something? So it was really interesting that all of those walls we were trying to get through to systems 
it finally started getting discussed. Oh, there's this startup that's working on this way for people to signal, you know, human skills. And our signaling is like an apprenticeship. We drop you into little situations and we get to see how you apply. So it's like a digital apprenticeship. And as you're wow. doing it, you get to see how five experts handled the exact situation because that's what the system, the whole learning system misses. It misses, well, how do I compare to others out there who know how to do this? Because most people don't have networks, so they don't know. So, um, so that was where, you know, as you know, I shared with you, we're, we're backed by Juvo Ventures, which is the fund of Western Governors University. And that's where we started seeing, you know, the shift. Um, now, I have to be clear, Daniel, you know, the shift is still slow. Um, no, okay. You know, right? So even though the pace accelerated, the yeah. shift is still slow. Um, yeah. um, but that being said, I'm I'm still hopeful. I haven't opened up for a long time. You know, for two years, we did corporate. Only recently, I reopened up our vertical in learning management system. So learning marketplaces and business schools and career uh -huh. schools at universities, because I'm seeing this tiny window to, to go back and start knocking again. <laughs> and and, and, and Sally Ann, what's the resistance? They don't understand it or they do understand it and they're threatened by it. I don't think it's a threat. I think, you know, change is hard, Daniel. Okay. Change is very hard. And I think there is two, you know, two things that block. Um, uh, uh, most of us. So number one, if um, if we're profitable um, and we really don't have to change, there is no fire under uh, our, 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 any of yeah. us to change. So I think that's the first thing. So if all the stakeholders, parents, teachers, everybody, there's no real fire of, oh my gosh, we're, we need to survive to, and innovate. I think that's one thing. And then the second thing is in terms of the system itself. So the measure of success um, as in terms of a, of the system, is the measure of success that I produce an actual student who comes out employed, is work ready, can keep a job for 12 months, or is the measure of success the output of I graduated 300 and they made it through and they have a certificate? And I think... Yeah you know, the measure is more about the output of the certificate versus the outcome of yeah. the qualitative outcome of how did I really, you know, put someone out there and made their yeah. lives better. It's and fuzzy think, math. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, Sally, and we're, we're seeing dropping rates of enrollment in community colleges in, in the United States. We're seeing uh, a loss of public confidence, public measures of confidence in higher ed uh, dropping significantly. So I think what uh, you're doing speaks to some of that. Maybe that is the fire uh, that that has us in higher ed um, uh, more motivated uh, for, for change, to see that if fewer people are enrolling and the public as a whole has less confidence in us, uh, that might be the impetus that that gets us moving a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you see the shift, right? So you see now I can go on a Coursera and I can take, you know, micro credentials and that has yeah. much more street cred, me getting something from AWS and IBM. So corporates now are our educators because they're actually educating to the market. So, yes. um, you know, if you ask many of the corporates, would you prefer a traditional university degree or what if somebody comes with you with AWS cloud plus IBM, whatever, and whatever those stackable credentials are, the majority of high, you know employers today will say, no, I want the guy with the AWS Absolutely. and the IBM and the stackable. So I think the, the street cred today of a degree has diminished Absolutely. significantly. Um, and I, I truly hope, as I said to you, I'm speaking to you um, with the blood of an educator, right? Yeah, uh, fair enough. <laughs> right? So, I say to you that um, I hope it's the impetus to look at the system yeah. as a whole and ask, you know, who are we and why are we here? And I think this whole AI layer, I'm about to put out a paper with NVIDIA um, next month talking about the entire shift that is going to happen with education pedagogy and job taxonomy, where no longer is it just hard skills and soft skills, but hard right. skills, soft skills and AI 
enabled right. skills. And the entire system has to now change because it, it's not going away, right? I can tell you. Oh, no. Today. No. AI can be scary for some, right? Do I look like I know what a JPEG is? You know, so there's it's a, a adoption curves. I do want to talk about what you said about the street cred thing, because this is a really oh. interesting point and re really one that we, and I like that you framed it as street cred because that's exactly what what it is, right? And you, if you look at a college degree and you go outside of technology, because a lot of the companies that have removed degrees from their hiring systems, some of the companies that you talked about are technology companies. And there's a really clear line. Like if you get AWS certification or you're taking an IBM class or, or the Google cert, and you're going to be going into coding, there's really a, you don't need that degree. Yeah. But when you look at other industries like sales or HR or whatever, and you, you take that college degree, what it becomes is a risk management tool for hiring, where if you don't understand that person, if maybe you're not hiring for a technology person, but you're hiring for somebody that is just good with soft skills, or we don't call them soft skills anymore, right? power skills or whatever you call them. Sure. The college degree minimizes your risk and you go, well, I don't know what they're going to be like, but they got a degree. So, you know, we're, we're going to just take that as a qualifier. How do we package? So I, I always say that the, the difference between the skills stacking and the skills training and degrees is structure. We understand the structural um, foundation of college degrees and most people do, right? They know what a bachelor's degree is and a master's degree is, and they think they understand those values and it steps up. It's like stairs. So it's easy to understand. When you're talking about skills-based learning and stacking, it's much harder to package it in a way that spans industries. How do we do that? How do we get the packaging of it across to employers and to the average consumer in a way that they go, oh, wow, I get what this is? Yeah, so I'm going to challenge one part of what you're saying and then answer. How dare you? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's so, a fact that's a fact so, i do have to say to you i cannot remember the last time i actually looked at where someone went to university as a criteria for hire oh unless, i totally get yep unless you know like you know i mean my, my cto is stanford ai right so i mean i would notice a stanford ai i'd notice an mit i'd notice right i'll notice the you know, again, I'm a tech company, right? Um, you know, heavy in AI. That being said, um, you know, right now I'm, you know, running a, a, a summer intern program for students and it is just not even in our ballpark where they are. There are certain criteria and questions I'm looking for that, you know, I can tell in just giving them a tiny project. Are they curious? Do they know how to tinker? Do they ask the right questions, right? There's, yeah. so- uh, Joe, it's no longer about what you know. It is actually about your learning agility because mm. nobody today, nobody today in the world that we live in are experts of green skills, metaverse, all of this AI. Everybody is a beginner yeah. in a beginner's mindset, right? And, it, you know, the 40-year-old or the 50-year-old that has been out there for 20 years, 30 years, they are a beginner just like the 21-year-old or the 18-year-old. And there are certain things in that beginner mindset that you're looking for. Um, uh, so, I mean, that would be the first thing I would say to you, right? So I, I, I think that statement about university giving social skills um, or the, the hu I call them human skills, I think, I don't think that's correct because that's the thing we complain about the most about mm -hmm. young people coming out with zero human skills, no community, everyone's on their devices, don't know how to <laughs> communicate the whole nine yards. So I don't think that's correct. I, and I do think it the, it's a very top tail 10% um, uh, that matters in terms I, of, that. I agree, by the way, I agree with you. I just think a lot of employers look at that degree as a miss uh, the, the it's risk mitigation. There's an assumption that some of those things have taken place. So yeah. it's, it's harder to look at the skills and understand yeah. it. If you're in an industry, like, I don't know, telecommunications or, yeah, you're, yeah. you know, yeah. so I'll tell you, I'll tell you how we do it. So, uh, you know, I was also a huge part of the, 
um, you know, creating a skills taxonomy, you know, of the um, uh, open skill network, you know, I was part of those original groups and, you know, uh, wallets, etc. So here's the problem with that, which goes to your question about credibility. Most of these wallets and these micro credentialing, they actually do not have street cred with employers, because you mm. can put all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah. Um, um, so, you know, this is this is kind of where, you know, I kind of step back from that. I'm going, wait, you know, and I, I uh, my measure of success is you got the job. The reason we educate and the reason we upskill is to better our lives and get access to opportunity and get those opportunities and hold right. on to the opportunities for, you know, six, 12 months, whatever that measure is. So I think that layer of how we micro credential and these, you know, wallets. And, you know, I know there's tremendous work being done, but the reality is, is that if employers do not find value in it and they are the, you know, the, 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 the purse holders of jobs, then you are correct. That's not a real, you know, way to, to, in terms of micro credentialing. So I'll tell you what we did at Gleek. And as I said, we're in the human skills part that um, has been of, you know, value, right? And and it's something, remember, when you're building AI and you're building data sets and insights, it's a work in progress. It's never done. So we use something called a stack. And let me give you an example of what I mean by a stack with these five industry experts. If I put um, Daniel in a role, let's assume Daniel is a 21-year-old, and I put him oh, in Oh, boy, role. do I wish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Those are the laughs> days. When I put Daniel in a workflow of a micro journey of the day of a data scientist, I'm just going to give you an example. And he has these micro situations and I get to see how he's applying because remember, it's a digital apprenticeship, right? Five, 10 minutes a day and I'm constantly monitoring him. I get to see how he applies some critical thinking, some creative thinking, some judgment and decision making in those areas. And as I'm looking at Daniel, I'm also visibly seeing how five industry experts, real data scientists, actually apply those skills in those situations. And I can immediately see the distance between what Daniel is thinking and doing and what someone who's been there and done there, done that been doing. And what it does all of a sudden is it opens up my eyes. So Gleek is a real inclusion tool to be able to go, wait a minute, even though Daniel is 21, he is- I find it hard to believe. <laughs> That's right. Uh, he is thinking and acting just like those Microsoft data scientists out there. I need to keep an eye on Daniel, hmm. on him in my pipeline. So this is where the signaling of, you know, and this is what's missing off of most LMS platforms. So if I go right now on any of the platforms, Udemy, LinkedIn, Coursera, I might see yeah. Daniel as a certificate in whatever, but how Daniel stacks up in applying what he learned against people who are doing that stuff, I have complete, I don't have visibility on that. And that's what matters, right? So that's, that's Joe, where I think that's that's how we do it at Gleek to show that signaling. And I think that's where the system needs to get to, where you are able then to confidently go, you know what, that quality of thought and that a, a quality of application is close to, or I can see the growth, whether I use Bloom's taxonomy or whatever taxonomy, I, you know, very agile learner, that's someone I want in my company because everybody will have to relearn or- yeah learn the, the actual hard skills of doing things all over Think again. about but that as a, t as a quick takeaway, Daniel, and then I, I know I could see wanting to jump in, but did AI, even though it's existed, but now that it's popularized and we're all uh, infants in, uh, you know, in a way, right, because it's moving so fast, did it level out this learning playing field? And now as a manager or a leader, maybe I have a question around AI when I'm hiring someone and I say, have you been experimenting with AI? What have you explored? What have you done? And that person comes back and goes, you know, I haven't done anything with AI yet. And you just go, hmm, what, you know, is that, is that a curious person? You know, if somebody comes back and says, oh yeah, I've been putting stuff in AI every day. It does this, it does that. I mean, I just wonder if there's like an AI question. Is it, I'm taking that away because I've got to do interviews this week and I'm going, man, uh -huh. I want to find out about curiosity a little bit. Thanks, Sally Ann. That was a great tip for me. Yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. Well, uh, uh, Sally, and I, uh, I love kind of the intersection of AI, 
and these real live breathing living mentors, right? So a couple of questions about 500 plus mentors. Um, and I mean, we're not talking about guys sitting around in a barbershop. We got Nobel Prize winners. Uh, tell me about the mentors. How do you find them? How, how does the mentor interact with the AI? Sure, sure. So our um, our our community is you know kind of three levels. We have coaches, mentors, and industry experts, right? So okay. um, and I keep the spotlight ones at five hundred, but below that we have thousands and thousands of experts and mentors just feeding our data lake. Okay, and you are correct. These are not consultants. These are not sitting. These are you know the head of AI for Nvidia globally, Simon C. It, you know it sits on our platform. The head of Accenture in the region sits on our platform. You know, Nobel Peace Prize winners sit on our platform. You know, the Google data scientists sit on our platform. Um, how do we find them, right? So, you know, that's the first question. People yeah. look at them. Yeah. How did you? How did you attract all of these people? Um, uh, so, you know, in in two ways, which is really interesting, right? So. There is a side of the platform that is our impact side of our platform. So we power the UNICEF Yoma platform globally. Um, we power the Jayo in India, which is tier three city. So their insights are feeding the bottom of the pyramid and okay. they get impact reports of people they're impacting number one on a, on a daily basis, millions of people. So amazing. Yeah. So most high level experts, they want to impact exponentially and we give them a way to do that. The second level and the reason why they're there is that 10% of the equity of Gleek is set aside for our most engaged experts and mentors. Uh -huh. So um, they actually are vested. Many of them sit on our cap table. They are vested in the projects that we do. They sit in some of the world's biggest companies. They actually make up about 50% of our pipeline of business, Daniel. Okay. Um, the third level that they're highly engaged is, you know, tell me which expert or mentor out there does not want to be an NFT tokenized guiding governments mm -hmm. and boards around the world. We give them the most interesting projects at country levels um, uh, to do work. So, you know, it's a, it's, and they learn off of each other. So our mentors and experts, we build community with them. They're in groups of 100. They, I mean, many of them go into partnership together. They're cross domain learning off of each other. They're publishing together a real kind of tribe community. We have raving fans with them. In terms of mentor GPT, which was our latest release, um, we were very fortunate that we landed the contract um, with the Dubai government for Expo 2020. We had about 20 million users. So our data lake is one of the largest data lakes out there on application of human skills globally. Holy so, crap. Yeah, it's really exciting. I think, you know, uh, uh, nobody realizes we're actually a data company sitting below all of this. And now you're getting data but, in all the time, right? You're just, yeah. Continuing all, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, I mean, we're powering, we sit quietly and we're powering many big job boards, all kinds of platforms all over the world we power. So, you know, our, 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 our mentors and experts, they are the, some of them are the benchmarks in terms of how our algorithms read. Uh, what does an outlier answer look like? Because we're really looking, uh, Daniel, from our mentor community, not for the generative norm, which is about 80% of good, which is what ChatGPT can show you. What we're looking for is obscure, contrarian, deep experts who can Love see it. context that nobody else can see. And what we realize when ChatGPT, you know, we always knew that's what my patent is, you know, so I, I proudly share, you know, I'm a sole inventor female and a patent. There's 4% of us in the world. Absolutely. Um, so, um, but what we realized when ChatGPT came out, you know, the first thing we saw is like, we were just like, holy crap, let's run all of our micro apprenticeships through ChatGPT and see what happens. And what holy we crap! You said right it. Away, was, you know, and I love ChatGPT, but I call it cheap thinking. It's the generative norm. And when yes. you start seeing how, you know, uh, that tiny 10%, 20% of the population out there, yes. how you, then you really realize how significant we are as humans when we sharpen our human skills, our creative skills, our critical thinking, our leadership, our entrepreneurship, you see the beauty of, 
you know, what it means to have wisdom and be, you know, in G and what it means to be human. So, um, so that's what Mentor GPT does, Daniel. Oh, uh, yeah. Join the movement to mobilize and revolutionize higher education by picking up your copy of Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education today. This book has been featured in Forbes, NPR, Harvard Business Review, CEO World Magazine, NBC News, CBS News, and Business Insider, among many others. Don't miss out on what today's highest college leaders have to say about the future of higher education. Pick up your copy on Amazon. That's amazing. And, and that, so that's the value added, right? Beyond the, uh, the uh, GPT. And how, uh, how recent was that? You said that's your latest, uh, that's just yeah, in the last just couple of months, it. right? We just released it uh, two weeks ago, like literally. Congratulations. So, uh, yeah, it was huge for us. So we took in our first entrepreneur in residence, uh, Haley, um, as I said, Stanford AI, just brilliant young lady. And she, this was her first product launch for us. And um, uh, really excited. I mean, it's a soft launch right now. We're going to go hard on it uh, by the end of August, you know, because it's the summer. So we figured sure. if anything breaks or any kinks, we have to work through, we'll work it through. And then we blow it out, um, you know, the last quarter, but really exciting to be able to bring yeah. that to the Congratulations. That's a big deal. That's amazing. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I love what you said, uh, Sally Ann, about, about AI, right? So if you think about AI and you use it, you mo uh, most of the people I know or that are my family and whatever, they're using a, like a Google, um, just like a yeah. Google search, like, you know, what's the weather today or whatever. And, and, and you're going to get out great results. It's going to be yeah. like you put it in a Google search. But the true power of artificial intelligence is in our understanding of how to critically think through an issue and what to ask to elicit responses that help us build a case on something or discover something. But if you're not thinking through it critically, if you don't, if you don't it is a skill set, right? Because you can sit there and put in search all day long and, and you're not going to get yeah. anything beyond what a regular search bar can do right now. But if you really sit and think about something and, and you're looking for something in a certain way and you can think through that issue, that's the thing we have to measure is how, how somebody thinks through what they're trying to find. That's skill development. And what you talked about your patent is I think you're only, you have, your patent is around measuring the soft skills. Isn't that, yeah. isn't that right? Can you tell us more about that? Cause this is a, sure. this is a awesome issue. Sure. And I want to just say something, Joe, about what you just said before I answer this question. What people do not realize with uh, ChatGPT and the tools out there, whether it's Bard or Claude, is that you don't actually need to know the questions. You can actually go to these platforms and say, I want to develop, I don't know, a business plan. Right. What are the questions I need to ask? Yeah. <laughs> I did that um, today. I said, I'm going to interview Sally Ann and I, I got to ask a chief identity hacker set of questions. And it gave me all these questions. Yeah. And but, you, you know, know. And you can also go and, and, and this is what most people miss. You can go, and what am I missing? Yeah. And if I had to argue against me on this issue, what are some of the points of views out there again? So it is forcing us to be able, even if we don't know, because here's the thing, our limited tiny brain, um, um, uh, we can't think through our blind spots and our hidden areas. And now we have this enhanced tool, um, but sometimes our ego gets in the way as humans going, well, I need Daniel. to know, right? Like, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so that being said, um, if we if we swallow some humility pills and realize that we are only operating, I don't know what the percentage is. It's like some tiny percentage our brain is operating, and to be able to go, you know what? Like I don't even know what to, I, I might be the smartest person in the room, but I am human. I have biases, blind spots, you name it. Let me help. Let me allow this tool to help me, you know, surface right because it's really surfacing those yeah. things. Um, now to get to your, you know, around the patent. Um, uh, so the reason why, if I look right now, um, I can look at, you know, university transcripts, or I can look at, let's say a LinkedIn profile, right? With a resume. And if I go to the soft skills section, there's always something on soft skills where it says, you know, either I have a certificate in leadership or my collaboration skills are strong or, but here's the thing. 
what the hell does that mean? Yeah. Good right, question. Right. Yeah. And people right. and people voted that you're good in it, but they don't even know you have the time. Yeah, right. yeah. I, like I've know. noticed that everyone has excellent communication skills. Everyone exactly. does. So tell them like have, it is. I have to tell you the funny story. I actually had a call with the LinkedIn product team um, in Berlin about, you know, they used to have this endorse feature that's not active anymore where you yeah. endorse someone for these soft skills. And I just looked at it and I go, what the hell is it that the most popular person has the most votes yeah. for, yeah. you know, you're great and leader. I said, what the hell does that mean? I'm sorry. I, I don't know if the hell is a bad word. People would but ask, they, and you probably got it too. So people would email me and go, would you endorse me for this? If I endorse I you, will. I will do no such thing. <laughs> it's true. So that, so, so all I know is I had my mother's endorsement across the board. She oh, thought I was so good. <laughs> so that being said, we have this um, you know, we have this whole even today, there is no real way of um uh and 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 and, and human skills is if not more than 50% of most jobs. So any frontline facing job that involves managing people, facing people, um, uh, unless you are locked away in a room by yourself all day, just doing something that requires deep, hard skills, human skills is actually the determinant of your success. And not only your success, you're rising in that role. Ah. And, yet, and yet we don't have a system that can say, wait a minute, I can see Joe or Daniel, how you apply leadership in different situations and how you apply critical thinking and it's situational here's the thing about humans it's situational human skills right we don't apply it in different ways in different situations there are nuances of that and being self-aware about that and being able to constantly it's a it's not a psychometric test of i'm going to have someone do a psychometric test at the beginning of the year and this is you know we change and shift and evolve some and based on whoever months. we might be interacting yeah. with, it's the variable. Yeah. So it can be every three months. It can be every six months. It can be whatever our, our, our level of behavioral change. So my patent is around, it's exactly around a signaling in a quantitative, qualitative and a 360 feedback loop. Um, that's how my algorithm is based, where I can signal to agents and AI the level of human skills that you have and your rate of change of human skills. Because even though you might, let's say, be weak on something, if your rate of change is really high, then I'll take a bet on you, right? Uh -huh. Because I know if I put you in the situations and you're going to grasp quickly, you're just happened. Sometimes people are just in the wrong environment for us to see them thrive and bloom. But if I can pick up on that behavioral rate change and I put you in the right environment to thrive, then you are going to thrive. So, so that's what the patent and the uh, algorithm is on. Um, it's very. Well, can, I, can I jump in real quick and ask? So you're sitting there in Dubai. You've you've got operations in India. We're in the United States. How do cultural uh, uh, differences play into this algorithm? Because what might be knocking it out of the park in one setting is not yeah. okay in another one. Yeah. So, um, you know, people often say to me, why are you in Dubai? Um, uh, so here's the interesting thing about Dubai. 90% of the population of Dubai is global. So I actually have data sets. Uh, people, do, the population, uh, the local population here is like 100,000 people. That's it. Uh -huh. A very tiny percentage. Yes. Is one of the most global places in the world in terms of access to opportunity. Now, when Gleek started, um, you know, uh, one of our big first corporate clients was Prada USA. So we immediately, our data sets are so far and wide um, in terms of, and you are correct, you can pick up on the patterns. So a product manager in the US has different behavioral sets that are needed versus a product manager in India. Um, you know, within this, and you know, we, we can immediately subtly pick up on that. So even though we are sitting here, you know, uh, it's one of those really interesting places in the world to be. Um, uh, you know, I'm Canadian, right? I'm, I'm, I, you know, grew up in in America, um, mm -hmm. um, but in terms of access to opportunity, um, 
you know, this is the place in the world you want to be right now, just in terms of the, you know why, Daniel? Because there's no legacy systems you have to fight uh, against. Yeah. So they're very easy to adapt new innovations. You know, um, you know, the fact that a startup powered the whole skills of the future pavilion for the world fair, or the fact that I'm powering systems, you know, whether it be in Saudi or whether it's because there's no major legacy systems. If I come yeah. to the US, there is all of these clunky legacy systems that I have to get around that, you know, um, would take something I would take three months to close here might take me, I don't know, five years in America. Yikes! <laughs> How how uh, how uh, handy does your JD come into play as you work through all these things? Because you know ethics and you know yeah. a AI and bias and there's some big yeah. time. You know Microsoft's got a, a construct of uh, AI ethics put out there. How how important is that law background as you move into this space deeper and deeper? So I'll give you the funniest story about the JD, um, and then I'll give you, and I'll, I'll answer your question. So when I was first brought out here um, in the region, I was brought out by a government company called Mubadala. You know, um, you know they're pretty big, um, and I was brought out here to design parts of the STEAM curriculum mm. uh, for the school system, and. Um, uh, you know, part of getting approved by the government is you had to send out all of your degrees. And I remember sending them all of my degrees back in 2013. And as I sent them all the degrees, someone called and said, but where is your education degree? And I said, I never told you that I'm, uh, I have a master's in education. And I got really nervous because I'm thinking, holy crap, you know, they hired me for this big project and I'm, I, I don't have the right degree to fit their requirements. And that JD saved me. They're like, oh, but she has a JD. It's a doctor. We choose truth <laughs> over facts. <laughs> mm. So JD trumps, so JD trumps everything, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, so- Everybody on, understands the law degree. Yeah. <laughs> The second thing I would say to you is, um, you know, I practiced, um, uh, didn't enjoy practicing law. I'm a very creative person, you know, and uh, law has a certain type of repetitiveness um, uh, in, in it. But what I do have to say to you is, as a startup founder, I am so aware of things and I don't realize, right, because it comes like a knee jerk of you being aware of things like, you know, I was aware that I needed to file a patent on the stuff I was building. And I was aware of, um, you know, all of the governance that needs to get done. And many times when I go in and I'm doing projects for big companies, I know all the legal ramifications about what needs to be done. And I think I am in such gratitude, right? Even though it was painful, like darts in my forehead, painful. Nailed it. <laughs> um, it, it, it gives me such texture um, as a creative, because there is that side of my brain that is always keeping check on those data points going, okay, yeah, you need to cover that. You need to cover that. So, so Joe, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like one of those double-edged swords. Like, I don't want ever want to go back to my twenties, um, you know, having to go through that, but, but I have to say there are some benefits. <laughs> That's great. Daniel, do you have any final questions for Sally Ann before we give her the two to close out the episode? Yeah, last last question for me, Sally Ann, is uh, you mentioned the chunky legacy systems that exist some places, but not in Dubai. They absolutely exist in American higher ed. Yikes! So, yes. give, as a as a president, proud president of of a college, uh, Arizona Western College, uh, give me some advice for blowing up those clunky legacy systems and becoming more entrepreneurial. Absolutely. And thank you for asking that. Um, so I would say what you actually have to do is you have to implode it, um, you know, um, by creating a um, an innovation group that moves across departments that is actually separate and apart from the traditional operational group, because that's where things get stuck. It gets stuck into the ringer of the day to day. And that particular innovation group um, has um, separate projects that they can take on and pilot projects that they can take on and they can A-B test. So they have free range of going, we're taking these 10 classes, these groups of students, and we're going to A-B test a bunch of stuff um, through them that it's very short, that the outcomes, you can see the outcomes 
right away. And then what that allows is to be able to have evidence based because, you know, you also have to manage your stakeholders. It's not even the yep. system, the yep. people in the system, right? Um, rightfully so. As well intentioned, as I said to you, I am a teacher at heart. Um, <laughs> but what you are able to do is to be able then to have the students and those who go through that innovation to be able to have an evidence base to be able to go, here's what happened. Here's what happened in our traditional system. Here's what happened in this little pilot group, innovation group. We have roving across, right? Because a lot of times we create it, but with the same people and it gets stuck again. Um, um, and what you do is you're setting yourself up to have influencers now to start shifting parts right. of the system. So. I have found, and I use that even in corporations, right? Oil and gas is a big sector for us that we do a lot of innovation around. And, you know, often they come to me going, how do we get, you know, the whole thing? And I'm like, no, not going to work. Let's create our separate little group and have the ability, our little budgets, our separate little group to be able to run freely and Love run it. projects. Um, and that's the only way, Daniel. I mean, that's certainly, I mean, I want to say that's the easiest way I have found um, um, uh, in terms of uh, getting the buy-in um, to be able to change the clunky systems. That's great advice. I appreciate advice. that. Thank you. My pleasure. Yep. Little wins go a long way to explain something, but it's hard to communicate those little wins within your silo. You have to go cross-departmentally. I think that's a really good piece of advice. Well, Sally Ann, this has been amazing. I'm going to ask you our two final questions. One, what did we not say about Gleek? Anything that you wanted, you were hoping to say today or... Daniel, it's his first co-hosting. You were hoping he would ask you, but he's just not with it yet on the microphone. But what didn't we talk about about Gleek that you'd want to say? And then tell us what you see for the future of higher education. Absolutely. So I think what I didn't say, what I should say, which goes back to Daniel's last question, is you know just like how as a startup I created an entrepreneur in residence program. I think universities need to create entrepreneur and residence programs with those trying to interrupt the education um, system, because those are actually the best people to have around to help you be able to do that within the system. So I think um, uh, sometimes we think we need to hire and we need to do it internally, but sometimes our best allies and advocates are people sitting out there, which ties to what Gleek does, allowing you access to people who are out there who are doing other things, but are able to kind of, with a fresh eyes, come in and look at your situation and problem and be able to go, you know what, I can fix that. So that would be one of the things, the model, Joe, of how people work with startups and those, you know, startups in the education area. Um, you know, that would be one thing. And in terms of the future of um, education, um, so I'm, I'm going to say something very controversial. Uh oh, wait. wait you get, let, me, <laughs> let, me get, let me get. Let me just tune up the audience for it uh, with with this little number that I have and I didn't use yet. Ready? Prepare to be astonished. Okay, now you can go. <laughs> so about two years ago, um, I remember making this comment, and um, uh, so just how we have Airbnb for homes. I do think if educators and higher education does not get its act together, we will start having a version of Airbnb for education institutions around the world because it will only be real estate. Um, and, you know, I say that from a place of deep sadness because um, the social skills that once upon a time we sent our children away to be able to develop is also not happening because of technology in terms of school systems and the networks. Um, you know, we can sit at home now and get all of those things. Yep. Um, so I do want to say that um, where there is in chaos, there is opportunity. And I hope educators with the chaos, I hope AI creates the right kind of friction and chaos for education to seize educators to seize the opportunity and reinvent who they can become uh, hmm. in our lives well it's not like we don't have very very smart people telling us exactly what we need to do to stay relevant we just have to do it we just have to figure out ways to move uh, as quickly as a technology company that's what i always say to the people i work with how do we move higher ed like a technology company moves it'll never right. get there all the way but we can aspire to move quicker and adopt faster 
and disrupt uh, harder uh, the systems that have uh, now holding us back. But one person that I know that is not holding us back is my special guest co-host today. It's been a couple years since I had him on. I say he did a pretty darn good job for his first time back on the microphone since I interviewed him. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Daniel Kaur. He is the proud president of Arizona Western College. Daniel, how did you like your first co-hosting gig here on Up? Oh my gosh, I absolutely uh, uh, enjoyed it. Had a blast, and and Sally Ann, I am just so impressed, uh, so inspired. I'm I'm ready to start blowing some stuff up this afternoon. Uh oh, something much more. <laughs> well, hold on, Holy Daniel. Crap. You know where to find me. You know where to find me. It goes. <laughs> Sally Ann go. said, "That's how it starts out." <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, we loved having you here, Daniel, of course. One thing I know about my guest is she is very smart, and we should listen to what she's saying um, because she's running an incredible organization that it's doing innovative work around human skills and skills development, things that we're all interested in right now. Ladies and gentlemen, here she is. Sally Ann Delacasa, she is the chief identity hacker from Gleek. Sally Ann, we hope you had a good experience here on the Yetup Experience podcast. I absolutely did. And Daniel, absolutely wholeheartedly. It was an absolute pleasure. You know, I'm always the biggest fan of any educator. Um, so um, uh, even though I ruffled feathers, I am a fan. Um, and, absolutely. Always, and Joe, um, wholeheartedly, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what I'm going to say. You've just ed upped. Attention. Forbes called commencement the beginning of a new era in higher education a dispensable touch point for what's being said in, about, and around higher education now. Don't miss the insights from 125 college and university presidents about what the future of higher education holds. Pick up your copy of Commencement on Amazon today.